you want to start turning to John chapter 9, we're going to read from there in a little bit. I have a few things that I want to say to start out though. We all have two twin needs. One is the need to be unique, to be an individual, to be ourselves. And the other is the need to belong. We have each of these deep needs. We need to be ourselves and an individual and we need to belong. We need a group of people where we fit in, where we can call our people. And so what we are going to be talking about in these coming weeks is the notion of honor and shame and how grace transforms what honor and shame means. So, we need to be an individual and we need to belong. Western civilization, that's us, has often focused on the individual. So, when we grow up, you know, when we're going through school as parents raise us and so forth, we often hear things like, be yourself, reach for the stars, follow your path, follow your heart, that sort of thing. I was uh, watching... TV recently and there was a Diet Coke commercial and there was a a girl on that commercial saying, whatever you is, just be you. This This is Western civilization. We focus on the individual. But in Bible times and Eastern civilizations to this day, the focus is on the group, not the individual. There are individuals, of course, but the focus of the most important thing is, is the group, where you belong. So who are you? You wouldn't throw out your unique qualities that make you an individual, but you'd throw out your family, your clan, your tribe, or your nation. That's who you are. And that's your primary identity. So in a number of Eastern countries, when they write their name, they put their last name first. Because this is their identity. That's their primary identity. We put our first name first because we think of ourselves as individuals. So falling in line, respecting superiors, and saving face, these are important. And this is what makes an honor-shame culture. The Bible was written in an honor-shame culture Primarily two honor-shame cultures. So a lot of these stories that we read don't come from a place of individuals. They come from a place of groups where there's honor and shame. And I'm going to do my best to explain this to you. I was studying this all summer, trying to understand it and get a good hold on it. When belonging, belonging to a group... When belonging is the biggest need, conformity is the highest goal. So your goal in an honor shame culture is to fit in, to conform, to be like the groups or groups that you belong to. And this is still true for us even though we are an individual culture. We still have groups, we have families, we have schools, we have churches, we have a nation and so forth. And we identify with these groups. And to the extent that we identify with these groups and desire to belong in these groups, we know what honor-shame is. Because every group that is out there, any group that you could belong to, every group has a system of honor and shame to encourage good behavior and discourage bad behavior. Whatever group that you're in, whether they're written rules or established rules or not, sometimes, often, it's just kind of subconscious. There's always a system of honor and shame in every group that encourages behavior that benefits the group and discourages behavior that undermines the group. And this this is true whether we acknowledge it or not. Every group has a a purpose, a mission, and when that mission or purpose is undermined, then shame is brought in to try to correct that. 
So, for example, we tend to honor soldiers who've served in the military. They've made some great sacrifices, and they've great, made great sacrifices so that we as a nation can continue on as an established group. If there weren't soldiers making those great sacrifices, we would not be able to survive as a nation or continue on it. So we honor them because they have made those sacrifices. Another example, in the Old Testament, one of the recurring consequences for disobeying God's laws was to be cut off from the community. That was a recurring consequence. So, for example, for seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. This is about Passover. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. There was another prohibition against just eating or drinking blood. So it says, whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. To be separated from your group was a terrible thing. A great fear that you did not want to have because your group was the most important. Now, honor and shame has many different aspects. We're going to cover these different ones in the coming weeks so that you can understand better what is going on in these Bible stories that you're very well familiar with. This really puts a new angle on a lot of them. But one that I want to talk about today especially is the notion of belonging. Honor is to belong and be respected by the group. Okay? And you're part of a group and you belong, that is to be honored. When the group respects you, that is to be honored. Honor is to belong to a group. I still remember one time when I was young, um, I, was, I was a kid, and uh, I was a bunch of other kids, and there was this tree house here. And it was a really cool tree house. It was very well built and looked pretty neat, and so I was going over to it to, to I want to just check it out and see what it's like. So I had to climb this ladder to get up there, and as I was climbing this ladder, suddenly there was this stick in my face, like just inches away. And there was this other kid at the top of the ladder holding that stick, and he said, what's the password? And I was like, I, I didn't know the password or anything like that, so I just said the first thing that came out of my mind, which is kind of what the situation made me feel like. I said, get out of my sight. <laughs> That's kind of what I feel like here. You know, I didn't say that, but... And the answer was, nope. Next, and I, there was a whole line of kids behind me <laughs> wanting to get in. So I didn't belong there. I was rejected by the group. And I still remember there was this sense of shame that I had when I had to turn around and go away. So honor means you belong. Shame is to be rejected and ridiculed by the group. For example, Jesus, many of you have heard this before, but there were these little children that were being brought to Jesus so that he would bless them. And the disciples were saying, no, 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 get out of here. You know, he doesn't have time for that. And Jesus said, no, let the little children come to me. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, okay? What Jesus is saying there is that the children belong so he is giving honor to children in a group or in a culture when children were kind of at the bottom of the group. They were the young and the inexperienced ones. And Jesus is honoring them. No, the children belong. I'm going to give them my time. A number of you are familiar with that story about Zacchaeus. It's one that we hear about in Sunday school a lot. Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Well, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and as a chief tax collector, he was shamed by his people. The Israelites had nothing but disrespect for tax collectors because they worked for Rome and they took your money. So Zacchaeus had a bunch of shame, and that's why he climbed that sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus because he was not a part of the group that was following Jesus. So Jesus honors him 
by saying, Zacchaeus, I would like to come to your house. You, you are worthy enough for me to come to your house. You belong here. And then at the end, he says, this man too is a son of Abraham. He belongs. So he honors Zacchaeus. Every group also has a hierarchy. So the children are kind of at the bottom because they're the young and the inexperienced. Usually, at least in the Bible times, it's the older and the most experienced who had, were kind of at the top of that totem pole or maybe the smartest and such. And we tend to conform to these authorities to belong to the group. Shame is what we feel when we fear rejection by our group. In a group-oriented culture like the Bible, being rejected by your group is to lose your identity. It's tragic. It's terrible. So turn to John chapter 9. With all of that in mind, try to notice the aspects of honor and shame and belonging and not belonging that you notice here. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So we went and washed and came back seeing The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the men who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, And are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we can see, your guilt remains. All right. So looking at this passage from the perspective of an honor, shame, and what's going on here, the man born blind honors Jesus as a prophet. Who do you say he is? He is a prophet. So he is honoring Jesus, lifting him up as an authority. Now Jesus dishonors the Pharisees' tradition of Sabbath. He's not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. He made mud and applied it to somebody's eyes. That constitutes work. That violates the Sabbath. So therefore, he could not be of God. This is their reasoning anyways. It's unacceptable that an honored person would dishonor their heritage. So the Pharisees are shamed by Jesus here. So the Pharisees seek to discredit Jesus to save face. They need to save their reputation, their heritage even. Because they can't have somebody who's esteemed as a prophet discrediting everything that they stand for. So they're trying to drag this blind man in to say, okay, what really happened here? There's got to be something about this guy that makes this a hoax or makes him a fraud somehow. Because there's no way that this guy could be from God. So they even bring his parents in. Maybe this guy wasn't born blind. And maybe just now he's suddenly saying he can see. Well, maybe that's it. So let's bring the parents in. They bring the parents in. And the parents, you can tell, the parents are afraid of being kicked out of the group. They want to belong to the synagogue. This is part of their identity. These people are Jewish just like the Jewish authorities, and so they want to belong to the group. They don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. They would lose their identity. And so they defer to the son. Ask him. He's of age. We know he was born blind, but what happened since then? We have no idea. Leave us out of it. We don't want to get kicked out. But in contrast to these parents, this man who was born blind, he's not afraid at all. You can tell. This formerly blind man is not afraid of being kicked out. He's somebody who tells the truth straight up, straightforward, whether you like it or not. He's not afraid of being kicked out. Now, I want to also point out, he's not confrontational about it. So, in verse 25, he says, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So he's not trying to go after him. He's not looking to be confrontational. But when they try to be confrontational, he stands up. So the blind man receives his sight by grace. It was grace that restored his sight. This blind man didn't earn his sight. He didn't fix his own eyes. He didn't even ask Jesus to receive his sight. Jesus just walked up to him and applied that mud and said, go wash. The blind man receiving his sight, it was purely by grace. He experienced God's grace in receiving his sight. It was a wonderful gift. We all value our sight and wouldn't want to lose it. So to receive your sight after being born blind and never seeing before would be a wonderful, amazing thing. And only by God's grace. 
because certain blind people had been known to be healed before, like the man says, but somebody born blind being restored, that has never happened in history. And this grace that he receives releases him from their honor and shame. That's why he's not afraid. By receiving grace from God, he is not bound to their system of honor and shame. He is not afraid of them. He's not afraid of getting kicked out of the group. Whatever shame that they heap on him, he can handle it. He doesn't know much about Jesus. Where is he, they asked him. I don't know. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But he experienced grace. And that changed him. So, in verse 28 and 34, the Jewish authorities, they try to shame him. They try to get him back in line to respect the group, to uphold the group's heritage. You know, come on, get back in line. They say, they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And then later on, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us By saying we know that God has spoken to Moses, they're honoring themselves and their group by connecting themselves to Moses and therefore to God. Because we know God spoke to Moses and therefore we are Moses' disciples. So therefore we are connected to God. That's our group. Our group starts with God and then Moses and then us. So we're up here. We have God on our side. What do you have? You have this guy. This random guy. And we don't even know where he comes from. And by saying that, they shame Jesus by saying he does not even belong to a group. He has no group at all. We don't even know where he comes from. This guy just kind of appeared out of nowhere. He's an individual. He's a loser. He has no group. They try to do this a number of times to Jesus, actually. Trying to say, you have no group. In John 8, 13 and 14, the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Well, Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going. I know where my group is, or where I belong. And then later in 18, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Jesus' group is his Father. That's where his honor comes from. So he doesn't need to belong to these groups. He says, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Jesus' Jesus' group is in heaven. And so he's not swayed by the pressures of honor and shame of the groups and needing to belong here. So because this blind man honored Jesus... The man was rejected by his group. It says, and they cast him out. That means they expelled him from the synagogue. He no longer belongs, and he is shamed, and he has no identity. He's just a guy out there who doesn't belong to anyone. So he received the ultimate shame. He received that shame that it talks about in the Old Testament of being cut off from his people. That's a horrible thing in the ancient world. To be cut off from your people. To have no identity. Nowhere to belong. But then in verse 39. Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, so that the blind would see, and those who see become blind. The man shamed and disowned by his people is honored by Jesus. What he's saying here is that you, formerly blind... Now receive your sight. And not just your physical sight either, but you see who I really am and where I come from. And those who think that they can see, they're actually blind. Because they don't know who I am or where I come from. They don't recognize me. It's like they're blind to who I am. Jesus honors this blind man above his group. You're the one who can see. Every one of them is blind. 
So for us, Jesus came and died on the cross to open our eyes that were blinded by sin. Sin is a shroud that separates us from God, that blinds us to who He is, His greatness, and all of the light and goodness that He represents. And by Jesus taking our sin away, that shroud is lifted so that we can see as a picture. And so that is God's grace to us. We can see because Christ took away our sin. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. When we say the Apostles' Creed, we call Jesus our Lord. Why do you call Him our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with His precious blood, He has set us free from sin and from the tyranny of the devil and has bought us body and soul to be His very own. So, in the honor-shame paradigm, we belong to Jesus. That's where our honor comes from. We belong to Him. And the experience of grace releases us from shame. By experiencing the grace of God that lifts the shroud so that we can see the Father and God and all His goodness, we are released from shame. When you belong to Jesus, you are released from the fear of of not belonging. You're released from the fear of being cast out, of having no one, of going nowhere. When you're accepted by Jesus, you don't need to be accepted by the crowd. You don't have to be. That's no longer a pressure for you. This whole peer pressure sort of a thing, that, that doesn't matter to you. When you realize you're accepted by Jesus and nothing can change that, you don't have to conform to any other group necessarily. So we all have a need to belong. That's a universal human need. We need to belong somewhere. Where do you belong? Where do you belong? When you belong to Jesus, you are not desperate to belong to human groups. This blind man's parents, they were desperate to belong. And so they were going to say whatever they needed to say so that they can continue to belong and continue to be honored. It says in John that some authorities actually believed in Jesus. But because they were so concerned about belonging, they never said anything. So in John 12, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They were more concerned about the honor and shame of the Pharisees than they were honor and shame of Jesus. Now, it's light, nice to belong to groups here on earth. It's nice to belong to family. It's nice to belong to groups of friends. It's nice to belong to a country or a company or a school. It's nice to belong. And so, you know, many times we might have a preference to do something different, but for the sake of the group, we'll go along. If it's inconsequential, if there's no sin involved or anything like that, we might choose to go along a lot of the times. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's nice. It's not a need. We are under no pressure to belong. We are freed from the honor, shame of human groups because we belong to a heavenly group. We belong to Jesus' group. The Pharisees were so concerned to maintain their honor of the people that they were blind to the truth of Jesus. They were more worried about human honor and the honor of their group. But when... You belong to Jesus, you are freed from that. Philippians 3, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship, our belonging, is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When you belong to the Lord, you don't have to go along with others. And because we belong to Jesus, we give our honor to Him. We honor Him above anything else, even if it means being rejected by our groups. And in honoring Jesus, we will inevitably shame human groups that we belong to. It's inevitable. Because the values of God always, at least at some point, go against the values of us in this world. So at some point, we are going to clash. The groups that we belong to here are going to clash with our heavenly group of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, which one are you going to follow? Who are you going to honor? Are you going to honor the group that you belong to here so that you can continue to fit in here? Or are you going to honor the one who you really belong to? Would we honor Jesus if our group shamed us? Would we still honor Him? That's the challenge of this story. Well, I want to tell you that the honor of belonging to Jesus is greater than any shame of the world. Any shame that they can heap on you. To have the honor of belonging to Jesus like this blind man, it doesn't matter if you are kicked out of the synagogue, if you are cut off from your people. That's what this blind man shows. I'm going to close by saying Psalm 62, just a part of it. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence to shame him? Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of higher estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. O Lord our God, help us to see the honor that comes from You so that we would not fear or dread the shame that might be heaped upon us by any groups that we might belong to. We thank you for our groups, but Lord, we most of all thank, are thankful that we belong to you and the honor that it is to belong to you. And so we pray that we would always seek your honor and that our honor and salvation would be in you. In Jesus' name, amen.